and welcome to the Speaking of Music podcast. This is Jake Manzi. My guest today is Ryan Hummel. Ryan is an in-demand guitarist for hire, a producer and songwriter. He's been a sideman for a lot of great singer-songwriters, most recently as a member of Amos Lee's band. Ryan also was the musical director of the Amazon Prime hit show Daisy Jones and the Six. We talk about all this with Ryan. We talk about his early days of touring and becoming a new father and his new record, which is called Default to Open. The episode today is brought to you by Raspberries Records, as always. Raspberries Records is a record store in Ludlow, Massachusetts, located at 207 Windsor Street. They've got records, they've got tapes, new and used, stereo equipment, and they've got a real fine staff, real nice people over there at Raspberries Records. So next time you need some records, head over to Raspberries. This episode is also brought to you by Gigantic. Gigantic is a cocktail bar in East Hampton, Massachusetts. They make some of the most delicious concoctions over there. Everything's fresh. Everything's made with love. So if you are in Western Massachusetts, go buy Gigantic. And if you like what we're doing on the podcast here, you can support it at our Patreon page. That page is patreon.com slash speaking of music. We appreciate anything that comes in there. I love talking to musicians and talking music with people so anything that comes in on the patreon page just goes to keeping this podcast afloat we appreciate everything that comes in through that page so thank you all right and now to my conversation with ryan hummel here we go here we go ryan thanks for having me in uh, your studio here thanks for coming um i will have properly introduced you, you know, beforehand and all that. Um, yeah, no worries. But uh, yeah, so you've got a new record, Default to Open, Yes, out. Um, and yeah, I've been listening to that the past couple days and digging into some of those songs. And so it was recorded back in 2016 in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And you, from what I gathered use some students from the Blackbird Academy yes. to play on the record. Um, so they didn't yeah. play on the record, but oh, they okay. but they did engineer the record sort of collectively okay. and under the I don't want to say supervision like their children, but you know, under the guidance and sort of guiding hand of um a couple of the staff engineers yep. and, and faculty for the academy okay. at Blackbird. Okay. So I I was really lucky to kind of get in with the Blackbird Academy as uh, like a visiting artist, because the way that this thing works is that the the students get this fifty percent in the classroom and sort of getting deep into the weeds with the program, computery, geary sort of side of things, and then they get fifty percent of their time just hands on in studio. Yeah, and so they need folks like me to come and make records there so that the students can have real experience um, engineering. Yeah. So anyway, yes, that, that that was that. So yeah, I hadn't heard of this Blackbird Academy. How did you how did you hook up with them? There's an artist and a fantastic producer named Ryan Ordway who runs the studio up in Portland, Maine. And in I want to say 2012 or 13, uh, he linked up with the Blackbird Academy folks right as they were getting started. And one thing that they do that's really cool is they bring in guest producers and guest engineers who are like legendary, heavy hitting people in the industry. (laughs) And they pair them with visiting artists. And so it becomes sort of like part masterclass, part recording session. It's still wildly productive. But so I, I was in Ryan Ordway's band and he brought me and a few other musicians and actually another local Western mass guy, Mark Seedorf, yeah. brought Mark and I down as part of his band. And we stayed there for a few days and we got to work with the incredible Ken Scott, who was on pretty much every Beatles session since he was 16 years old, starting yeah. with Hard Day's Night. Um, I think he started as a tape librarian um, at what became Abbey Road Studios. And... 
so Ken, you know, among other credits with the Beatles is, you know, Super Tramp, Crime of the Century, all that David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. Um, so many incredible records. Some of yeah. my favorite Jeff Beck records he did. So he worked really uh, hand in hand with, you know, some of the most pivotal rock and roll music. And we got to work with him for a few days as he, uh, you know, produced Ryan's music. Yeah. And uh, I was able to just keep that relationship yeah. alive with with Blackbird. And uh, I ended up calling them up a couple of years later and just telling them that I wanted to make a, a record. And I had this idea to do like a couple really simple um, but lively sessions with me and a drummer playing live. And then I was going to fill in the rest of the instruments. Yeah. And that's what became Default to Open. And so... Did you do that overdubbing down there in Nashville? Or? Some of it. Okay. But what's really cool is that almost all the vocals on the on the record um, are live from those sessions with the drummer. Wow. So it would be like, you know, we'd sort of set up the drummer facing a window or a, or a big, you know, window door, and then me in a booth with an... Uh, you know, and then an amp in another booth, mm -hmm. and we've uh, got we've got your daughter Nina. Here, my daughter Nina's uh, here, just burping yes. and, and 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 rattling away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'd have you know the two of us set up and uh, facing each other, and I would sing and play mostly electric, sometimes acoustic guitar, yeah. and those would be the basic tracks: drums, guitar, and vocal, and all that stuff stayed on the record. Yeah. Um, it's way more typical, as you know, with your own records to sort of frame things out, starting with rhythm section, but not with vocal, yeah. usually, you know, not with a, um, a main vo lead vocal. Main so, keeper, live vocal, yeah. Yeah, it was just like, you know, I'm, I'm not like a, a super refined lead vocalist. I'm much more refined as a, as a supporting sort of background vocalist. But this was something I wanted to do at that time to like just push myself into this territory, yeah. commit to the vocals. Yeah. I did, I think, punch things in a little bit, or you know, edit things, yeah, take to take after the fact. But and was, was there any trickiness there with like getting the sonics of the drum, having had the drums in? Uh, you know, it it was so well recorded yeah. that there wasn't really an issue with guitar bleed into the vocal mics, or or vice versa. Sometimes it was a tone match thing. For the most part, um, Andrew O'Dell, you know, yeah. was the one overdubbing stuff um, when we came up here, and I, we were in his house, and I did things like the like all that lead guitar stuff on all set and on wide open, and some guitar overdub stuff and keys overdub stuff on. <laughs> Hi, Nina. <laughs> on all the time in the world, like that was all done at Andrew's house. Okay. Before he had ghost hit, yeah, and <laughs> oh, sweetie, yeah, we can, yeah. So okay. yeah, so the a lot of the overdub stuff, guitar wise and keys wise, that was done with Andrew O'Dell, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, he just he does a, a great job no matter what the project is. He yeah. just sort of is always he's always game, you know. He's always just ready to 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 dive in yep. and he made it happen. He mixed the record. And I remember that we did multiple rounds of revisions on mixes. And sometimes that would include revisiting a vocal or whatever. After eight years, seven, eight years, I, I kind of just like went and dug into those folders and and explored those mixes and decided that what I wanted to release was just the first version of everything yeah. you know and for full context yeah this you recorded these in 20 back in 2016 yes, exactly just, thank you it yes. was released 3 it, months ago yeah, 2 months ago yeah in September, September 2023 yeah, okay, yeah, yep yeah. so with some perspective, you know, more than some perspective, with you know, almost a decade of perspective, <laughs> yeah. it, it it was like looking at another artist's archived work or something, you know, like another person's art. Yeah, and it it felt sort of like putting a, a, a compilation together. Yeah, you were looking at early it while works. you still yeah. had power to make some decisions here and there, you know. Yeah, right? like there and. 
if I listened as the person, you know, identifying as the person who was playing those songs and recording those songs, I'm going, oh gosh, I, I could, I could resing that. I could replay all that stuff. And, yeah. But I think the point really for me was, you know, we just had Nina and we just moved back here from Los Angeles. And I was just sort of letting the dust settle. And part of that was feeling this, this drive to release the record and clear the pipeline and just, you know, like being about to have a baby and like sort of being a new parent to an unborn, <laughs> as of yet born yeah. child, <laughs> um, really, really changed my perspective on a lot of things and, and, and just widened the scope and, and, and let me have access to maybe like a 10,000 foot perspective a little more easily. Mm-hmm. And what happened with this record was just I I just didn't I just didn't care about all the things that could be better. I just cared that it it, it was something that I wanted to you know it's like hey I want to show my daughter that not just that this is a record that I made but I want to show her that it's just okay to put things out in the moment. Like I spend so much of my time working with other artists as a guitar player or a, as a producer in the studio, and I'm always encouraging them hey. You know, don't worry about it. Th- th- this is you. Yeah. This is you right now doing your absolute best, and and it's beautiful just for what it is, and, and and trying to kind of maintain some some wider perspective. And it it was always so hard for me to have that perspective. Yeah, take your own advice. They were giving yes. other people for years and years, right? Yeah, and it took years and years yeah. for me to take my own advice. Yeah. But I think it really changed, changed the way, way that I, I will make. And, and interact with my own music from here on out. Like just doing that and the act of putting it out in, in that state and just deciding to be proud of what that is really helped me, I think, ultimately move forward and, and, and into the next sort of batch of writing, which is a lot about baby and yeah, parenthood. I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, so do you think yeah. if you hadn't had this experience and hadn't had Nina on the way that maybe this record could have possibly been shelved for another shelved few years or maybe or, just you know maybe come maybe I would have chosen different mixes or tried to yeah. you know hey Andrew can you remix this right. fourth time and it 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 doesn't it's like it starts to feel like um undoing mm. you more, know more, more than the original yeah, spark yeah like was. now yeah. we're unraveling a thing that we that we made that was just a snapshot. And it's like, you know, you take a picture of something and then you do all this work to doctor it up and you could go really f- so far with that that it's like you're you're deconstructing the whole image itself <laughs> that, yeah. that you are exploring. So I think, um, yeah, taking my own advice is really, really hard in the moment and having this, almost decade of space from this record let me just put it out for what it is and and you know who knows without Nina what 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 right. that would yeah, look how, like how could you know right yeah right but i mean it certainly wasn't happening without you know knowing that she was on her yeah. way <laughs> yeah um yeah one one song i wanted to ask you about is bury me that that one comes on and just sounds you know right from right from the jump yeah. uh, i was kind of uh yeah just hooked on that hooked one from is the top on that. It, I know it's right up both of our alleys, yeah. like stylistically yeah. and sonically. Um, and this record, I made this record before I had like a working relationship with uh, Griffin Goldsmith, who we've both worked with yep. now. You've a in, lot. You introduced me to, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um Griffin of of Dawes. Yes. And Dawes has been one of my favorite bands, probably my favorite current band for many many years and um it won't take really any listener who's familiar with their music uh, more than 30 seconds of of bury me to go, "Oh, yes, this is Ryan doing Dawes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is Ryan trying to write like Taylor Goldsmith and yeah. um yeah, I mean, and I'm not I'm not ashamed to say it. I mean, they're 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 in cr- an incredible force and yes. um I, I was feeling really locked in you know when i wrote that song it sort of came out sounding like that yeah and um and i sort of immediately knew how i wanted it to be how i wanted it to come across 
recorded. recorded. Yeah. And I brought in this drummer who I felt could do a really good job of like nailing the feel of that kind of music. And his name is Andrew Borger. Okay. Um, and the listener will know Andrew's playing from the first couple Nora Jones records. Okay. Like, was he in Nashville? Is that where? Or? So I brought him to Nashville. At the time he was in New York, uh, he now lives in Portland, Oregon. Um, and he's just an unbelievable drummer. Uh, and his feel on that song, and, and you know, he's on a few other songs on the record too. Yeah. Um, just there's so much life and and fluidity to how he plays and it's so comfortable you know like playing with griff is yeah. so comfortable yeah, and yeah. that's when i listened to dawes i always was so envious like as a songwriter someone who sings my music i'm like he has griffin goldsmith to play with yeah 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 it's like, it's like yeah exactly it's like this dude's writing songs and his brother is just the most like dialed into the lyric as any drummer could be and yeah. so I, I always felt that way listening to andrew and he and I had played a couple gigs together in New York. So that's how I knew him. And yeah. I flew him to Nashville. We did a couple of days of sessions and he's on half the record. And the other half is this, in, is a Nashville local, this guy, Travis McNabb, yeah. who um, the listener will know from uh, Sugarland and uh, more currently Frankie Ballard. He's been on okay. tour with Frankie Ballard for many years and just an incredible sort of one, two punch of my favorite drummers yeah. um, who I've, just lucky enough to work with at that time. That's awesome. Yeah. So in that song too, the first line, you know, keeping everything together with these uh, six strings. Yes. <laughs> which, yeah, looking, I was thinking about that and just looking at you, having known you, you know, that's yeah. what it seems like you've done. Honest, for, an honest lyric. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's an autobiographical lyric if I've ever heard one, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, and that was seven years ago. And it seems like you've still kind of been doing that. Yeah, 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 it's it's true. I mean, the the impetus for that song was me sort of taking stock. You know, it was like at that time I, making that record, I was on the road all the time. So it was a big a big thing to try and clear like a week, you know, yeah. uh of not being on the road or being between tours, things like that to to go and record my own music and be in a certain headspace to do that. And the song was sort of taking stock of all the time on the road and how difficult it can be to find any perspective on life, you know, other, th other than the very particular feeling of traveling. And, and, and it's a beautiful feeling. I love yeah. that feeling of being on the go. But it's taking stock of just the life I was living at the time guided by music that's a beautiful thing but there's also this element of um always looking ahead to the next day the next show day that it was a very diy what's the next tour kind of be touring in four so, months where right am exactly I like booking the next tour from yeah. the current one all of this sort of not being rooted in the present moment but doing something that demands that you're rooted you in the are, present yeah. moment so feeling sort of pulled in two different directions and ultimately wanting to write a song with some element of like self-soothing. Like, hey, there's not much of a roadmap here uh, for anybody who's doing this. And I feel, I want to feel proud of what I'm doing. I want to feel some sense of like, you know, ownership and, 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 and pride around the yeah. work. And, um, and to just let that be enough at the end of the day. And I often write songs that just send that message, that send some kind of message back to myself, yeah, you know, because yeah. when I sing them, it's like, if I'm, I really know the feeling of being connected to a song that's meant to soothe me or, or, yeah. or, or put me at ease. And that's your ideal, right? You would yeah. want to be the person that is um, reaching for those things and feeling present, and then you're writing it into existence yeah. almost, right? yeah. Yeah, I, I I think that's kind of where yeah. where I was at, and and then also just wanting to wanting to explore, you know, I always want to explore something about songwriting that's a little bit of a push outside the box for me. So you know, big Dawes fan, that song is obviously very inspired by them and that kind of music. 
Um, it also sounds like you, though. I'm not, you know, yeah, I'm not totally. hearing it, and I'm not like, oh, yeah, that's Dawes. All <laughs> well, you know that's what good. I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. good. Um, but yeah, I think the the just sort of a, getting focusing in on on a on a flavor of of a pop song that sort of is a little bit more up tempo than I'm used to writing. You know, yeah. has uh, just a different chord structure. There's things about that song. I'm, I'm fishing here because it's so long ago. Right, right. But um, I just remember that in and of itself, you know, I wrote the song and I played it back for myself. I was like, man, that's a good song. That's great. Yeah. That feels really good, you know. Um, and I felt like I sort of achieved what I set out to achieve. That's a that's a good feeling. That, that can that can last for a couple of weeks, you know. You'll be, yeah, you'll be right. walking around a little pepping your stuff. Yeah, you're oh, like, I man, I got, got a good, good one in my pocket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so so yeah, you're from you're from Amherst, Massachusetts. If we if we yes. take it back a little bit. Yeah. Um yeah, growing up, you know, was there was there music around the house? Lots. Lots of music. Lots. From yeah. Mom and dad both or both. Yeah. yeah. Um so I you know, my parents split when I was about a year and a half. Um, and, but my dad is, my, I grew up with my mom. My dad is a guitar player, an incredible guitar player. So it's sort of like this element of having it in your blood to a degree. He never really like sat down and taught me, taught me, but I felt like I was always absorbing these little things, whether it was like from what we were listening to together. Yeah. Like he would always put on John Schofield and he would always put on like Robin Ford and these great guitar players who have become my favorites, yeah. Jeff Beck. And um, and then on my mom's side, there, you know, she plays piano, she plays guitar, she was writing children's music when I was a kid. Wow. Um, and she's a writer by trade and was writing children's stories when I was a kid. Yeah. So that sort of creative energy and just a, an, an eclectic taste in music was always very, was always very uh, um, present in yeah. my life. Yeah. And I, I, I loved, I loved weird stuff <laughs> from an early yeah. age, you know, like I never really wanted to listen to the children's music. I'd always ask like, put on mommy's music, yeah. you know, it'd be like the doors. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, or like, you know, really avant-garde Coltrane would be on, on the radio. My mom would get a headache immediately and be like, I don't know what the heck this is. And yeah. I'd be like, wait, what are you doing? Don't change that. <laughs> don't change it. Yeah. So, so when you're um, starting to get acclimated with the guitar is that something that you kind of go all in on are you nerding out on the guitar are you like learning like you, what kind of kid were you in that sense i i i was like i was like I, my my mom would offer to teach me some chords and from the age of three to five or so i would insist that I I knew how to play my way, <laughs> <laughs> my, the song my way. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, okay. I knew how to play the song my way. I was a big Elvis fan. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's like the the really Sinatra, Sinatra. Well, yes, right? that's true. Thank you, and Elvis and Elvis. Sang I'm it too. sure. I'm sure. But yes, I'm you're sure. right. You're right, Sinatra. And so, like, part of playing in my own particular way yeah. as a toddler <laughs> was like taking the little short plastic leg off of the bottom of a kid's pool table, you know, a little plastic, you know, four inches off the ground pool table yeah. and they're hollow and I would use it as a slide. Oh my God. <laughs> so wow. Like, I, not, not because I was trying to mimic a certain slide guitar player. I don't even think I knew what a slide was, but just kids are creative, you know, kids are, I mean, I have a tiny baby and I'm just so excited to see what, what fresh hell she gets into and uh, with that creative spirit, yeah. you know, and, but then at a certain point, um, the pool table leg got a little old and I, I was feeling frustrated that I didn't know how to make the same kind of, you know, chords or the same kind of sounds that I was hearing, hearing around me. Yeah. So my mom taught me what she knew, some open chords and some bar chords. And, um, and then I started taking lessons from about six and, Gosh, there's so many fantastic teachers who I credit with 
everything I know, mm-hmm. you know, beyond that. Yeah. Like uh, Kevin Collins still teaches in Amherst okay. at the Red Barn, may, still maybe at the Red Barn. Um, Kevin Collins, you guys, l- look him up. Look, look him, him up. up. <laughs> John Sheldon, legend. Yeah. Rajnar Vajra, legend. Phil Defermery, last living disciple, direct disciple of Andre Segovia, you know, taught me in two kind of chunks of a couple of years each, um, a lot of technique around Spanish classical music. Yeah. And um, yeah, an, an incredible host of teachers Wow. That I was really lucky yeah. to have. Yeah. So yeah, it seemed like you were getting hooked on it kind of. And so when did you start? Is it high school you start playing with people? Were you always kind of gravitating towards doing the It was earlier actually. Thing? It yeah, was okay. it was young. I mean, yeah. I, I was ten years old when John Sheldon, my teacher at the time, he had this incredible band called um oh gosh. Boneyard? I think it was called Boneyard. Okay, yeah. So John Sheldon, anyway, he, he invited me to come play with his band. You know, I, I could play blues and I could, I could hang, yeah. you know, at that age. Wow. And um, <laughs> so he, he had me come to a, like a hotel bar gig that they were playing. And they had like horns and it was like a big, exciting thing. And um, my mother tells this story and she says that like on the way home after pl- sitting in with the band for a set or a few songs or something, I just, it's like, I could do that every day. <laughs> and I was 10 and I pretty much just did that every day, yeah. you know, um, in, in one way or another. Um, my mom was incredible just taking me around to the open mics, like the Iron Horse used to have this incredible blues night. I think it was Tuesdays. Yeah. And I met, you know, I met a very young Sonia Kitchell there when we were about, you know, 12. Yeah. Um, and there was this local blues band called Blue Illusion. And they were like 18 and I was 12. And, and, and they invited me kind of an open standing invitation. Hey, anytime we're playing around and you see us listed in the <laughs> advocate, just give me a call and come, wow. come sit in for a set. And my mom would take me around to these smoky bars in Springfield and, yeah. you know, all Southwick and all around. And, um, and I'd I'd sit in as a 13, 14 year old with them and with Janet Ryan, an incredible yeah, local yeah. blues singer as well. And ultimately, um John Sheldon, the same teacher who invited me up to play my first, you know, real gig, he ended up handing off, passing down the guitar seat in um a band with Susan Angeletti, who was a, a local blues singer around here for a long time. And in in her heyday, she would get all the calls to open for like Johnny Winter and BB King, yeah. and, you know, Buddy Guy or whatever. And she even opened for Wilson Pickett. Oh my god! I mean, in, in, incredible. I, I didn't do that with her, but um, I got the gig playing in her band when I was like thirteen or fourteen, and we would play all around. Uh, I got a lot of wild experiences that way. I bet. Yeah. And um, and. Your mom driving you. My driving mom me driving me. Yeah, like all through my middle school and high school years. Um, oh, sweet. <laughs> yes, I'll drive you to to bars. I'm glad they're not smoky bars anymore. Yeah. Yes, this is when you could still smoke in bars, and uh, it, it, such a strange time warp to think back like that, but. I, I mean, I, I really owe so much to the people of, you know, people who are at least 10 years older than me, most of the time 20, 30 years older than me, yeah. just opening the door for a child. And including <laughs> you. <laughs> including yeah. me, yeah. yeah. Just saying like, oh yeah, you can play, you can hold your own, <laughs> come get some experience, you know, and, uh, you know, of course, like the, the novelty of like having a 13 year old come and play some fiery blues licks <laughs> is, is, is hysterical. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I benefited so much by that and, and by my mom's just, you know, unwavering support of that. She really wanted to let me have these experiences in a, in, you know, in a safe way. So yes, that was yes. sort of the, 
the origin of like career and experience playing, you know, semi-professionally. And um, it was actually through the Susan Angeletti band. I was playing a show at the Charlemont Inn with Susan Angeletti and Seth Glear was opening. I, I was 15 and Seth was 14. And we were the only two teenagers in that bar, of course. <laughs> And Seth Clear, the the songwriter Seth from Clear, uh, the songwriter. Western Mass area. Yep, here, originally yeah. from Shelburne. Yeah, and uh, and now a, a resident of Holyoke, just like both of us. Yep. We were both in high school at that point when we met at that gig, and immediately started working together. Just sort of finding our lanes almost or what would become our lanes with within the context of our musical partnership i mean which ended up being you know working on record after record after record together and touring 300 days a year for like 7 years on end out of a car as a duo and it really just started with that one gig and then the next week my mom dropped me off at his house in shelburne and we got into some, you know, writing and it was like pretty clear from the beginning, like what a fun time it was for me to support someone as sort of dedicated to their craft as Seth, as someone who's really dedicated to my craft as a guitar player, yeah. just to kind of combine our, our passions in this really, really organic way. Yeah, Like there was nothing about what he was doing that that like threatened or or undercut anything about what I was doing and and, and vice versa and it was complimentary complimentary yeah. and yeah and and it and we still are such close friends work together on a lot of stuff you know played guitar on a bunch of stuff on his new record produced half of his previous record like it's always still going yeah and you could tell he was serious about it at that time so and, serious yeah he yeah. already had a couple like records out under his own wow. name. And he was 14 or something. Yeah, it's, exactly. <laughs> wow. I mean, and you know, like when 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 you're a kid and you find someone another kid getting after whatever <laughs> your thing is. Yes. With that same passion cuz you know, most of the time I would look around and it was just a bunch of I mean, I did grow up in a very musical community in Amherst at Amherst High School at that time there were so many incredible musicians and it's sort of notorious for churning out really artistic, especially musical types. Yeah. But it was really, really special to meet someone from a different school district, you know, just like kind of felt new, you know, um, and, and really special. So were you um, writing songs at that time too when you met up with Seth? Like were you, or how were you thinking about supporting a songwriter at that time? Were you? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I had my own band in high school. One was called Sharp Circle. Okay. <laughs> and we were like a rock band, a four-piece rock band. And uh, I was really comfortable mostly just being the guitar player and sort of, you know, it was a collective for sure. That band was like really taught us all how to play together, you know, as four people and sort of share a common goal for a, a unified sound. Um, and, uh, and I had a band called Threve, which was more of like an organ trio. We were really big on like soul live. And, and is that, that in reference to the, um, the SNL? It is uh, exactly what it is. Thing. Yes. Yeah, good. Nice, it, yeah. Nice. You sniped it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, I think like the Burt Reynolds. Yes. The Norm MacDonald. Yeah. Reynolds Norm, episode. Norm MacDonald's yes, Burt Reynolds. Yes, yep. Um, so we, we played more like sort of jazzy, funky stuff. And I was just exploring the limits of, you know, just guitar, my own guitar playing. And, 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 but I hadn't really played with a, a dedicated like singer songwriter before. And he opened up, Seth opened up the door to, you know, early inspirations of his, like, um, like Martin Sexton, who became just a massive figure in, in my musical you know, life, someone who I, I admire a lot for his his writing and his voice and his guitar playing. It's just also yeah, performing spectacular too, for right? performing. Yeah. Like God, just an incredible force that guy is. And another local. Yeah. And um 
And then one of the earliest inspirations for both of us, I remember like in our early, we started touring regionally in high school, you know, so we'd go up to like as far up as Burlington, Vermont, or as far down as Philly, you know, um, and just do weekends. And um, it was around that time, maybe right after high school or right at the end of high school for me, when uh, this new artist broke onto the scene, his name is Amos Lee. And he came out with this incredible record. Every song was a knockout. The production was so comfortable and understated and like living roomy and dry and natural. And it was so inspiring for me and, and for Seth also. Um, and I mean, yeah, it, <laughs> that is definitely another massive figure in, yep. in our, in our early, you know, car playlists. Right. Right. Um, and then, yeah, lo and behold, you become his guitar player years later, right? Years later, yeah. So so you're working with Seth, you're playing all these gigs on the road, and are you starting to get into production too? Or how does how does that yeah, happen? Yeah, like you end Seth up? and I would co-produce his early records. Okay. And we did a, a lot of stuff out of his parents' basement, sort of accumulating, you know, odds and ends for recording gear. Mm -hmm. And uh, and recording on Logic at that time, and I would sort of be more in the sort of musical arranging side, and Seth was doing more of the engineering. And it was fluid; we'd go back and forth with stuff. But I really loved to dig into like the way that the harmonic and rhythmic and tonal pieces could fit together. It was really exciting to me to watch. A, tr a song go from, you know, chords and lyrics on a page or like a beautiful performance by Seth with piano and vocal and to just continue to support that and present it in such a way that it, it, it became more and more compelling. And it's a delicate balance. You know, you, you, you can add things to the, to the, to ultimately detract from right, right. Yes. what the song does when you're listening to it as, you know, just with perspective as a listener. Mm -hmm. um, or you can add things that really add up to support the story and the lyric, the imagery, and create an environment for a song to, to, to go a longer distance yeah. and, and, and be more repeatable as a listening yeah. experience. You know, yeah. all that stuff was just so exciting to me still is so exciting to me um and that that is really what lit the fire for me with production and and it wasn't until we really started hanging around like a lot of songwriters going to folk alliance international conferences things like that where we'd get all these you know you'd exchange cds with a bunch of artists and we put all these cds on and and the songs would almost always be spectacular. And the recordings of the songs would almost always be almost just sad, Black like Buster, so yeah. hard to listen to, like either overproduced, underthought, overthought, like too shiny, yeah, not loud enough, right. you know, like over compressed or whatever. And just, I just sort of saw this opportunity to go like into that world of production with a passion for songs and a real sensitivity to what it is to work with a songwriter. Yeah, because clearly you're sensitive to it if you're hearing the uh, over-compressed even, you know, like right. you're hip yeah. to what that even means at that point where, you know, yeah. somebody else might say, I know this just sounds bad or not, you know, it doesn't sound good, you know, but right. you're identifying so clearly there's some... Yeah, like having sort of an ear for, you know, these elemental... Um, really basic, you know, what we would call effects or or, or processing, yeah. like EQ, where you know you take it's just what you would do with your car stereo. You take the treble down, and it sounds like there's a sheet over things, and you boost it all the way up, and it's like piercing your eardrum. And do you feel like you had a natural proclivity to that, or it was something that 
you know, combined with getting into the, you know, 10K hertz here, you know, learning that yeah, kind it, of stuff. It, 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 it wasn't technical in that way for yeah. me as much yeah. yet. I mean, it became more technical, I think, on the road, being a duo, you know, so the, the, the stage would be Seth behind his Yamaha P120 electric piano, just a, trying to get as organic of a piano sound as possible. And so we learned really quick that, like, in order for my acoustic guitar, the two, like, our two voices and the piano to sort of create a pleasant, large, but not larger than it should be sounding for what it looked like, you know, like to create this really particular sound that we wanted to transmit on stage night after night, you know, we're not carrying anything other than our instruments really, you know, when it comes to gear. So no PA gear, you know, we're not carrying a sound person. So we're in these different rooms, whether it's like playing in a coffee house and you're doing your own sound or in a big bar and you're trusting someone who like only really engineers bands to engineer a duo yeah. with no bass or drums. Yeah. We learned really quick what it what we needed to say, how we needed to communicate with the sound our engineer. sound. Yeah. You know, we're gonna need to pull 1K out of the piano at least 5 dB, you know, big cut because the, otherwise you get this just rubbery sort of obviously fake ringing out frequency. Yep. Um, you know, my guitar needed a certain treatment. I didn't want anything, you know, under, um, you know, 60 hertz because that's really bassy and boomy. And every time I would touch the acoustic guitar, the pickup would just <laughs> like freak the PA out and get this big boom. And I didn't want that. We didn't want that. Right. We didn't want that big bassy sound. Yeah. I wanted this contained. I wanted the keys to occupy the low frequency with his left hand and for my guitar to fit inside of that. So that was where it became more technical yeah. and like, hey, can you take the reverb off of my guitar? And, you know, I think it's still in the monitor. I know it's not in the house anymore. Yeah. You just learn to Learning listen those, for these yeah. things with so much repetition, you're doing this day in and day out with a new engineer every time, a new room every time, new PA every time. And it really teach, it really taught us how to um, understand the sound that we wanted to have on stage. And it also helped us, because we would talk, is really all we would talk about is just like how to communicate that and be, be pleasant to work with in an environment where there's a lot of times you, go into a club and the engineer working that night isn't super pleasant right. to work with. And yeah. so how to maintain, <laughs> you know, how to get what we need out of the night. Right. And by, you know, by just being effective communicators, I think the communication aspect of producing records is really um, what started to become the passion for me. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen you in your element, you know, mm. I remember one time, yeah, you were recording with Haley Reardon and directing your friend Bobby Hawk there on violin. Yes. Just going back and forth. Yeah. And yeah, it seems like that is something you're very good at and passionate about in terms of, yeah. It's, like, tra ideas. it's like translating. I mean, yeah. you know, an artist walks into a studio and works with an engineer and the engineer isn't, isn't necessarily going to have the bandwidth or the patience to, to try and, sit patiently while an artist describes what they want to sound like by using references of other recordings that have little to nothing to do. It's like, oh, this recording makes me feel the way that I want my, this song to make me feel, but it's not going to have any of the same instruments maybe, you right, know, right. or like describing their sound using colors or describing their sound using feelings and emotions. But it's all valid. Right, everyone just speaks sort of a different dialect of mm -hmm. this language when it comes to trying to put, you know, boil their music down into words. words. Right? Yeah, it can be really hard, as you know. <laughs> um, and I just realized that, that 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 almost everybody could benefit by having somebody in the room who knows enough about the gear to take what the artist is saying and say, "Hey, you know, I think we're looking for a darker guitar sound than that." Or I think we're looking for um, a shorter reverb than that. Take what the engineer is saying 
go back to the artist and right. say, you know, it's not that it's not that they're being unreasonable, but the limitations that we're working with in here are X, Y, and Z. You know, if you play the piano and sing at the same time, you're gonna have to commit to those two things as a group. So when we edit, we edit the piano and the vocal together. Otherwise, there's some crosstalk. There's what we call bleed. Yeah. There's piano and the vocal mic. There's vocal and the piano mic. And just learning how to navigate sessions and ultimately just create a more fluid, um, less anxious, yeah, more comfortable, more comfortable and more efficient and productive session for for people. It just it's the cool it and it it's like watching that work. You know, watching that sort of not intervention really, but just watching that communication path open up, and then ultimately, you know, my job. I always felt like if I did my job really, really well, and the and also if everybody else brought their A game too, you know, it was such that I could sort of show how to communicate by being an example, and and like kind of where the language barriers might have been, and then not be quite the middle person as much and let let the artist really speak for themselves. Uh, you know, so the goal wasn't for me to overtake things or, um, you know, dictate what happens next so much as help train the parties who do best when they do talk directly to one another. You know, like right. it's, it really is best when yeah, you don't need a translator. Right, the artist has the lingo and the confidence to yes. speak that language. Yes, yeah. and and then the artist comes out of the session or the project ultimately with that much more lang you know, te technical language to sort of go like, okay, this is, I like things that sound like this. I like this mic on my voice. I like this compressor on my whatever. And, you know, sort of arming the artist with more, more confidence yeah. ultimately yeah. in the studio. Yeah. And so how do you approach when you're going to make a record? Yeah. With, with a songwriter or somebody, you know, like that, the batch of songs and, you know, I'm sure you've done it plenty of times now, yeah. you know, through the whole, that beginning process of listening to demos yeah. and to the finished Production, you know, and like it, what is the job of the producer in that sense? Uh, I, be, I, mean, I mean, everybody will 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 give you a different answer, and yeah. I I think I would give you a different answer just depending on the artist and yeah. you know, so much of it is like, a, you know, being a producer for me feels a lot like accumulating all of these skills and these sort of like micro like getting really in the weeds about gear and really into the weeds about theory and really like being very learned as much as possible and then just sitting on all of that, not needing to pull those cards, but being the person in the room who can just patiently listen to what someone is asking for. Often an artist will come into the studio with a wealth of negative experience, studio experience under their belt already and sort of come in in an anxious state. So then the job before any conversation really happens at all is just let's let's all get comfortable. That's going to look different. You know, those needs are different from person to person. Yeah. So it's, I think I like it because it's always going to demand something a little bit different of me. Yeah. And where, where did you kind of, were there some producers that you had worked with that you, you know, took some, yeah. yeah, that formulated, you know, your approach today or whether you had work with them or there were producers that you admired from afar? So one person who I got to work with by way of making records with Seth Glear um, is, a, is a guy named Dave Egar and he's a cellist. Yeah, you've told, you've told me about and him. And he's a like pianist. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, I will tell anybody yeah. who will yeah. listen about Dave. <laughs> um, Dave... <laughs> you've heard Dave a million and one times, probably without realizing it. I mean, one of the first big sort of string project things that he did, just him on cello and a violinist overdubbing multiple times to create the illusion of like an orchestral sound. Um, he got called in to do that on Coldplay's Viva La Vida. So that 
jump, 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 to jump, jump, to jump, jump. <laughs> That's basically Dave and this violinist Anton like 80 times or something. And his process was, you know, working with Chris Martin at a piano to sort of carve out the string part that he was hearing, how he wanted it to feel and sound, and then ultimately translating that into what he knows about strings in the recorded medium, you know, microphones and placement and how to avoid the buildup of frequencies that happens when you're using one instrument on one mic in one room. And then layering that over and over again, you'll enhance sort of anything that's prone to poking out too much, pokes out too much. So he really knows the art form of string overdubbing. As a result, he's just gotten called by everybody to do this. And uh, he had a relationship with the label Empress Records and the artist Rachel Sage, um, New York-based label, New York-based artist. Uh, they signed Seth early on and paired us up with Dave in the studio to do some string arrangements. Wow. Uh, he brought in a violinist. Most of the time it was Rachel Golub, who is again, just an incredible player and studio musician. And we'd get together and, and Dave would just blow my mind with the depth of knowledge, his emotional sensitivity to the, to the music. You know, he had this like really interesting combination of he's like this brilliant, like beautiful mind type of guy. Uh, sits down at a piano and rips your face off, plays cello beautifully, can arrange and hear all these crazy outside harmony things and understands like how to make a string arrangement feel like a Disney string arrangement or feel like a Motown string arrangement or feel like a an Eleanor Rigby sort of more chambery quartet yeah, arrangement. Nuances, He's yeah. got so much control in the studio and with regard to arranging. And he just taught us all of that. He taught me that and taught Seth that. And I've gone on to use every bit of that not not to mention the sort of wisdom in life as a as a musician just he's been a mentor to me for so long and then he ended up producing my first ep around that same time when i was working with seth um so being produced by someone that brilliant and that capable just continued to light that fire for me like at that early time when i was in my early 20s and um and then just the other part of that was, you know, someone who I didn't meet for a long time, who then ended up circling back. And I, I met him and he had a major influence in my career uh, recently is this producer, Tony Berg. Tony um, is an LA based producer who, you know, you know, from his work with Phoebe Bridgers, uh, his work with Blake Mills um, and, uh, and, you know, having signed Amy Mann and Beck to their yeah, first it seems record, like he's always on the labels. pulse of things, sort of, right? Absolutely, and has been for a long time. I mean, he would, it goes back. He's a guitar player, an incredible guitar player, and he, he was the guitar player in the original Rocky Horror um, wow. in in the seventies. So he he was always, you know, someone I I studied as a producer, like specifically the Jessica Hoop record, "Hunting My Dress." the Joey Ryan EP, Kenter Canyon. Uh, I mean, like my mind is like at a standstill with how many records of his in that sort of 2010s era that I just couldn't stop listening to. And he just had a flavor to what he did in in a way that, that brought out all the nuances of any artist that he was working with um, and did it in this, with the sonics that I liked, you know, darker sounds and, um, layering things in a very particular way. I, it just, I'm always excited listening to something that Tony's produced. Yeah. And, um, and, and then ultimately, yeah, he, he produced Amos's record, My New Moon. Um, and when I started working with Amos Lee in his yeah. band, we were touring behind that record in support of that right, record. And so right. I, I met Tony Berg on that tour when we were in LA. Wow. So how did yeah? So how did the Amos gig end up coming up for you? So you were playing around for a long time, you know, playing as a with side a, man, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And 
in Western Mass. In Western right? Mass, yeah. you know, playing with Seth Clear, um, playing with the Sweetback Sisters as a guitar player and pedal steel player, um, playing with Heather Maloney as a mostly acoustic guitar player and, you know, tight vocal harmony kind of thing. Um, and Haley Reardon, who you also mentioned. Mikey Sweet, another incredible local artist. I mean, there's a wealth here in Western Mass. And although I always looked at the future with this sort of like, okay, I, it would be really cool to experience this whole other echelon of like bus, being on a tour bus and being a headliner in theaters and things like that. I didn't have any, I wasn't frustrated. I've never been frustrated by working with the artists on signature sounds or on a small label or who are from here in Western Mass. I mean, because there's so many incredible artists and there's so much music to be made here. Um, and it's a great place to leave from and come back to when it comes to touring. So, you know, I, I wasn't feeling antsy at all with that, but the call came as for Amos pretty much as an offer. Just, hey, can you do this this summer? Are you free this summer? And um, I did, I had to call Heather Maloney and say, actually, I can't do all this touring. And, and she was incredibly understanding with that. Um, and just encouraged me to go, you know, get after it and do the next thing. Um, but the the connection there was uh, Amos's sort of the the way that I worked with Seth as a side person, sort of like a right hand man. You know, Amos's version of that is this guy Jaron Olevsky, and Jaron is also from Amherst. His mother was my piano teacher when I was a kid. And Jaron himself was my camp counselor at this incredible summer arts camp called DASAC, which is Deerfield Academy Summer Arts Camp. So he's not that much older than me, but he was old enough to be my counselor when I was 12. And he must've been, you know, 17 or 18. And he goes on to uh, move to Philly, go to UArts and... Um, meets up with Amos in Philly. Amos is a Philly native and is on that first record. Wow. Uh, is on upright bass playing, you know, as a duo or a trio with their first drummer, Freddie, um, who stayed with Amos right up until I joined the band. I never was in the band with Freddie, but, um, you know, that's like a 20 year run or something as a, as a band. And, and yeah, I mean, Amos just sort of w was going in a really specific direction with that My New Moon record that Tony Berg produced. Wanted a band that he could kind of steer in some different directions compared to where he had been previously. And turned over like half of his band at the same time. So Jaron, by that time, Jaron was Amos's musical director and wasn't playing bass anymore. It was just playing keys and sort of MDing from the keys position. And, um, and the, the band kept kind of growing over the years, as I understand it. And to the point where it was like seven people on stage. So new drummer, new bass player and new sort of like third guitar player, which is what I ended up right, being like sort okay. of aux guitar background utility, vocals, man. utility. Yeah. yeah. Like I was, playing some baritone, some electric, pedal steel, singing. And um, and yeah, Jaron just called me out of the blue one day and just said, hey, can you, what, what are you doing this summer? Um, and just like that. Yeah. I mean, there was no audition. There was no, I never met or talked to Amos before the first rehearsal. It was just like, okay, you're coming to Philly these days and then we're going to leave for tour from there and that's that you know come prepared with pretty much his entire catalog under yeah, your belt yeah. <laughs> which is about 100 songs at that point point. and wow. um i i am just so grateful for for things like that in life that 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 pop up at the right time i mean that was on the heels of a big you know crazy breakup for me and big transition point in my life i wasn't yeah. really sure what was going to come next yeah and I was living by myself in this little studio apartment in Leverett. And I just got this call. I had maybe like seven or eight weeks or something to prepare before the first rehearsal. 
And I went out to Staples and I bought myself a big easel and a gigantic like pad, like big, big uh, pad of paper. Yeah, yeah. And I did all of the first drafts of my charts for that, just like by myself, blasting the music in speakers, standing with a Sharpie, writing, like dancing to the music, just just celebrating through the work, basically, yeah. having gotten this gig with someone who I've always played along to, sang along with on, on the records yeah. and been so inspired by. Love his voice, the soul element in his music always spoke to me, you know, like this, everything about it. Like, it, and then to think, oh my gosh, that was all training, you know, and, and you never know what you're listening, you know, when, when sort of influence and inspiration yeah. becomes the job, yeah, the ten, gig. Yeah, 10 years before you're listening to that first record. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're hired to play his songs and you literally know them. You know them. I know them. in your head. Yeah, you could, and then there are songs yeah. that I didn't, that I, you know, just deep cuts that I just yeah, wasn't as familiar course, with yeah. or gems that I would discover. And just, I built up all this further appreciation and and respect for Amos's catalog. And, um, and also like, you know, as a, as a guitar player or as any instrumentalist getting hired into someone's band for, for a live tour situation, you're learning other people's guitar parts. You're learning other people's whatever parts. Yeah. And, you know, as a pedal steel player as well, I got to learn all of these incredibly well crafted parts, you know, and go, like my job was to go deep on all these things that I would do that, you know, and transcribe anyway, yeah. just for the fun of it, you know, for the lesson of it. Yeah. So, you know, Greg Lease is this incredible um, LA based pedal steel yeah. player who sort of tends to play on the like, you know, Americana, not center of the map country type stuff. Yeah. So like Ray LaMontagne and the Pariah Dogs record, think he's on that that might just be kevin barry on lap steel but he's on all amos's records that have pedal steel i think it's pretty much always great yeah. um and i got to learn all of greg's parts and not that you know you're going in and playing verbatim what's on the record but sort of coming in armed with a really solid understanding of what the record does and then so you can pivot from there yes. you know you pivot into whatever the band is doing now yeah amos in particular has like just such an ability to transform his own music, you know, say like a really famous song like Sweet Pea, where we would play it in different ways from night to night, week to week. You know, he always would want to get something different from the horns. You'd always want to get something different from the energy of the song. Yeah. You know, he's like still really engaged with the that part of it. Yeah, yeah. like arranging and, and you know, um, he always knows what's best for his own music and yeah. would sort of let us workshop things during sound check and then kind of come in and, and go like, yes to that, maybe change that a little bit. And, and um, gosh, I mean, yeah, my respect for, for he and his music and the way that he works with his band, the way that he trusted us um, and really wanted us to play and, and, and just explore and have fun with that. It just, yeah, my, my respect just grew and grew. Yeah, it sets the tone for the whole band, I'm sure. Yeah. What was it like, um, yeah, touring on a on a big bus and stuff like that? Because I, I, I do remember one time uh, being on the same festival with when you were playing with Amos. Yes. And, uh, and it was festival at the farm. And I remember talking to you, you know, you rolled out of the bus and, you know, <laughs> from who knows where the night before. And I remember you said something about... Uh, the co your coffee morning ritual and how that yeah. kind of grounded you like in a feeling like you were at home. So yeah. That started so, with set. That started okay. like way back. I mean, cause I, I've always loved coffee and making coffee and, um, you know, have a taste for the, the good stuff with coffee and, um, it became part of my road routine. Yeah. To kind of wake up and make myself a, a cup of coffee and I'd have this little rig that I'd travel with, like an AeroPress usually, or some kind of pour over thing or, you know, 
would change from time to time. But yeah, I would grind my own beans in a little hand grinder. Well, actually, with, with the great thing about touring with Amos is that he's also a coffee snob. It's, it's like ha- more than half the band was like that. You know, we all really liked nice coffee. So we would, um, you know, text in the mornings and go like, oh, the good coffee's at this place. Um, or like, you know, there were times when we'd be, sometimes we'd be traveling, you know, in the morning after a longer drive or something. We'd do the next part of the drive in the morning before the show. And I would make, you know, pour overs for the whole band or something. I just love doing that. Um, And I like doing it for myself. I like doing it for other people. And it just, it's one way to stay in touch with just another part of myself, another part of life that isn't just guitar stuff, just music stuff. yeah. And um and bond with the band over, you know, good food and good drink and yep. and yeah yeah it must have been but pretty, they, had, they yeah so having a mu- having a having a bus to facilitate the morning coffee right. ritual was really helpful yeah that, yeah, yeah that's what I was getting. <laughs> and not doing been, it in a uh, Prius was exactly, a whole different thing yeah, after years and years of touring around right in whatever vehicles it may have been it must have been nice to you know you got oh, a bus for the driver such a treat bed. yeah such a treat yeah Amos um. Amos likes to travel comfortably. You know, buses were always really nice. Uh, the drivers were always great. Was there partying and things like that, or they? Not okay. a lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like we, nothing crazy. I expect that. Yeah, I yeah, really like we, yeah. I mean, you know, I love weed. Yeah, and it was really fun for me. Like the the first iteration of the band that I played in with Amos um, because a couple members shifted around in the time that I was with him. Um, It was me in the rhythm section, to me, the bass player, the drummer, and then the whole crew on one bus. And then Amos and Jaron, and then the other two members of the band, Zach and David, who have all been with him for a long time. You know, so it's like me and the new guys on the crew bus and then Amos and like the tour manager usually and uh, his sort of three like longer standing members on his bus. Um, so two buses and a, and a truck is the traveling party, like a 18 wheeler. It's wild thing to go from like a car or a van to that. But um, I guess we were sort of the party bus on the crew bus. Like the crew likes to get a little bit loose after the show. You know, they have a long day of like 8 a.m. to 1 a.m., you know, when loading is done. Yeah, yeah. And um, so they'll like to crack open some beers or whatever in, in the front lounge. And then there's like this back lounge, um, you know, in between there are all the bunks, that like hallway with the bunks on yeah, either side. Yeah. And you walk down to the back and there's the back lounge. And yes, you would open the back door and and, and smoke would pour <laughs> out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun. I mean, it, it, it we had such an incredible band we all bonded over music, over movies, over, you know, smoking joints, yeah, right, over right, right. whatever, you know, food and coffee. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it was a really full, beautiful experience and camaraderie and like really being in a band and being part of a team and a family playing like that. every night, getting better each night. And, oh, right, yeah. yeah. And, and just, you know, sort of re- rearranging songs yeah. on the fly and and Amos would come in and be like, I want to cover this song today or I want to pull out this song that we haven't even thought about of mine from like eight records ago. <laughs> you yeah, know, just right. like that kept us all together. You know, like no one was ever resting on their laurels in that band. Um, we couldn't and we wouldn't want to. You know, it's like way more fun to sort of be engaged of with course, yeah. the arranging and just like the creating yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. And I guess yeah, it comes from the the top, you know. He's that way, and then you're, you know, everybody falls in line. Yeah, the first thing he really said to me that Amos ever really said to me directly it was like, we had this long rehearsal, this first day of rehearsals, and then he took everybody out to one of his favorite restaurants in Philly, and we all sat, sort of just like overtook the whole bar there, and he went person to person. There were a bunch of new faces, you know, crew and and three new band members. And he went around to each of us and just sort of chatted and got to know us a little bit um, and made an effort to really connect. And I remember that, like the thing that really stuck was he just said, hey, man, I just want you to have a good time and I just want you to be searching. You know, just, he's like, I'm going to make mistakes. 
and you're going to make mistakes and I'm going to laugh when you make mistakes right. and I'm going to laugh <laughs> when I make mistakes. You know, it's like, the, that's like the thing that is the quote unquote right thing to say as yes. an artist, you know, in a position of leadership that's like that. That's what you that. would say as a producer to somebody, right? I mean, right. Yeah. But standing behind that for like weeks, months, years on end with a band and like while you're out there really trying to accomplish, you know, the task of creating a great show and presenting an album and also, you know, writing a set list that's fresh each night that provides the audience with some comfort uh, in the old material and some adventure with the new material. Like all of those things tend to overtake that desire that an artist might have for their band to just be having a good time. Amos stuck by it. I mean, he really did every every night. And um, I just was so fortunate to watch him lead in that way, you know, yeah. and 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 to be led and guided in that way with with that sort of loose grasp, but then like a very firm understanding of what his music required of each member of the band. And he really was like playing us as a band. You know, he really did a great job of understanding what we each brought to the table and helping us refine our voices for this particular band. Right. Which yeah, it, I learned again, a lot about producing kind of what him. a good producer does, right? Yes. Is this, it seems like you're really good at this thing. You yeah. Know, identifying that in other people kind of and bringing that out in them. Yeah, he's he's just a walking master class. And um, I, I just, I will always look so fondly at yeah. my time. Yeah. With those guys. So on the road. yeah. So how much time was that? And it's yeah. It seemed like you guys played some awesome. You played Red Rocks, right? And, we did Red yeah. Rocks twice. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. So many, so many bucket list things. Um, not the least of which is just playing with Amos. Yeah, you know, playing right. with Amos's band and and getting to play with my old buddy Jaron. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, the coolest. Um, it was five years front okay. to back wow. for me, and it pretty I. Pretty much ended when I, <laughs> 2022, we were on the road. Um, you had moved to LA. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, my wife Cynthia and I, we were living in LA at this point. Yeah. Um, so I was on the road a whole bunch, and we would do like a month on the road, a month off the road. Well, I got COVID at the end of one of the tours. I wasn't well enough to join at the beginning of the next tour. So the guy who's now the guitar player in, in Amos's band is an incredible guy named Connor Kennedy from Woodstock, New York. Uh, Connor is already a friend of the band, so it was a good fit. He kind of filled in for me at the beginning of that tour that I was still sick for. And then we all met up at Red Rocks oh, and wow. did Red Rocks like all together. Um, it was a lot of guitar. And it was really, really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and ultimately it was, you know, just a, a week or two into that tour that I was late for when I found out, Cynthia and I found out that we were going to be parents. Wow. So she immediately comes down with the, you know, early first trimester sickness. And it wasn't easy to really find like consistent, you know, everyone in LA is like always leaving because everyone does what we do, right? right. We tour and mm. we're in creative projects, working crazy hours. So she didn't really have the support around her at a time when she was really sick and needed help. So I actually ended up leaving that tour a few shows before the end. Something I felt still feel really, you know, badly about when it comes to my relationship with those people in the yeah, band, yeah. you know, in, in terms of, you know, we always say it's like a family. Yeah. But ultimately it isn't my family and I, I love them yeah. so much yeah. and I felt bad to have to choose like that. But um, I did leave the tour and that was pretty much the end of my yeah. time in the band. Yeah. But um, everybody was so understanding in that moment when I, when I left, you know, to just say like, Hey, um, I have to go be with my pregnant wife now. <laughs> uh, and uh, I love you guys. And I'm really sorry to leave. Yeah. Um, and, and they, they got it. They got it. They understood the choice I made. And um, I, I don't think there are any hard feelings in any direction. Right. And I just, you know, I, I love all those guys so much. Yeah. How hard of a decision was that? Was that, you know, you're losing sleep over that well, kind I mean, of thing? Well, I mean, it was, and, you know, was it, yeah. it was hard. It, it, it was hard because, you know, you hate to, 
you hate to leave people in the lurch like that who have your back. And, you know, I understand that Amos and Jaron in particular, you know, took a chance on me as definitely a young, younger member of the band and, and, and someone that they sort of just hired sight unseen. And, and then I was someone who grew into that role in the band and, um, but ultimately, you know, when your family, when, you know, my wife needs me and it's like, you know, we, we've been having the discussion, you know, every night after the show, I'd say like, Hey, if you, if you need me to come home, I'm, I will come home. It's hard for me to decipher, you know, what is like, I'm having a tough time, but try and finish this out versus you got to come on the next flight. And, you know, I stayed out there as long as I possibly could have before it was, I need you on the next flight. Right, yeah. And so that's that's what I did. And 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 at that point, it wasn't a hard choice at all. Of course, it was, yeah. you know, logistically hard to pick up and just like go like, oh, organize all my tour stuff really yeah, quick. And, yeah. you know, but but that that's all really nothing. Yeah. You know, like that's, I found out that I was going to be a father while I was on a moving tour bus through Iowa. And, you know, Cynthia took the pregnancy test and, there you go. We were like, holy crap, here we are. It's happening. Yeah. I told the whole band, you know, you, you typically wait a couple months at least, you know, to tell people who aren't in your really like in your family. Yeah. But I was like, babe, I can't, I can't sit on this. These are the people I'm with day in and day out. I'm going to, they're going to know something's yeah, up if I don't. Yeah. So everyone was so celebratory and sweet and excited. And, um, you know, everybody from the crew to the band, to Amos. And, um, you know, it, it it was like the cool, it was so strange to sort of plop into this gig, this job all at once. You know, like, holy crap, I'm playing with one of my idols in this incredible band. It's the best band I've ever played with. It's the coolest, like, you know, sort of string of venues you could play. We're playing at the Beacon Theater. We're playing at yeah. Red Rocks. You know, like all these bucket list things traveling in style, you know, being comfortable, getting paid well, walking into the venue and your gear is set up for you already and all sound checked. It's like, I mean, it really doesn't get much better. No. Uh, and then as quickly as I came in, it was like, okay, time to leave. Yep. This is not the thing anymore. Yep. And I think just a big part of life is just letting those corners take you for the ride that they're yeah, going to take you for. Yeah. I mean, it was the same way I got in as the same way I got out right. pretty much, you know, with a, a phone call, a phone call. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you know that it's right in the moment, you just sort of, everything else falls away. You try and make amends if there are amends to be made and you try right. and, you know, you try and make things right in all places, yeah. but ultimately, you know, my aim is to be a present father, a present husband, and doing this job on the road is, you know, it's really hard for a parent to yeah. be away from their kids. It's really hard for a spouses to be away from one another, yeah. you know? And there are people in this band with Amos who have had to make tough choices before as well. But, you know, ultimately I made my choice in that moment and um, it didn't feel like a hard choice at all. Yeah. It just, it, it felt like a hard moment, but yeah, right, um, right. but the choice was obvious. It wasn't like, do I do this or not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so yeah, taking it back a, a little bit there, um, what brought you out to LA at that time and um, yeah. what, did you, what did you get involved in once you were out there? I had started playing with Amos in 2018. And after doing the first couple tours, I had already been talking to some people in LA, Griffin Goldsmith, Tony Berg, and they were really encouraging me to move to LA. I didn't have anything to move out there for, you know, no job or gig or anything like that. But I figured, you know, I'd spent enough time in LA to know that, um, the doors to like just working with people who I wanted to work with other musicians and producers and studios, et cetera, those doors would open a lot more easily if I had this experience of working with someone as 
sort of well-respected in the music industry as Amos is. Um, and having the good fortune of being in that band at that time, I was like, well, this is a good time to move to a new place. Yeah. Like I've got a good gig. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to move out to LA and like try and fight a bunch of other guitar players for the best gig in town or anything like that. And I mean, they're, you know, you're surrounded by greatness and you're surrounded by crazy amounts of ambition and, and, you know, creativity and everything it, when, when you're in LA. And I just didn't want to come to LA competing yeah, right, or, right. you know, without a gig and needing to sort of like hedge my bets in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went, Cynthia and I both just sort of moved on a lark. Neither of us had any jobs set Cynthia up. Tolson, your, Cynthia Tolson. Uh, Cynthia Tolson, <laughs> my, my, my wife, an yeah. incredible musician as well, yes, string yes, player. String extraordinaire. Yeah, so she kind of started in earnest her like string overdubbing, her remote string overdubbing career from Pasadena when we moved out there. Yeah. And um one thing that COVID might have been good for, I guess maybe it ended right? up yeah, it 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 really ended up giving her a lane. Yeah. You know, and she yeah. was sort of already on her way, had some really cool credits, already worked with you on yeah. your beautiful record. Yeah. Um and you know, a handful of other artists. And we were really lucky to just get like people would recommend her and, you know, she's really fun to work with and really easy to work with. So people would call her and then they would want to work with her again. So they'd call her back. So it was just her career sort of took off in that way. And um, I was just sort of like in between tours, you know, like trying to find the next thing or the local thing to become a part of. And a lot of generosity um, led to a lot of cool experiences and a lot of cool hanging out with people. Ultimately, Tony Berg called me up and said, uh, it was, it had gotten to a point where we were like, do we need to move back? This is still pre COVID. Yeah. It's like summer of 2019, but mm. there wasn't a whole lot of work coming in. Amos wasn't on the road. So I wasn't really making that money. And, um, so we were like, okay, it's expensive to live here. How much longer can we really do this without something happening? Yeah. So we both signed up for central casting to become like background actors, pick up a couple hundred bucks yeah, a day here right, and there right. to just, do, do something. that, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, well, who knows what that leads to. Yeah. <laughs> so I was actually on the Sony lot as a background actor um, on, I was just working on one episode of um, what ended up being one of my favorite shows of all time. It's called <laughs> For All Mankind. Okay. It's an incredible Apple show. Yeah. Um, Check it out. Yeah, not familiar. Uh, you won't really see me if you watch it, but <laughs> I'm in one episode in one of the seasons. I don't remember. But I was on lunch break. I get a phone call from Tony Berg. And he was like, hey, man, I know you're new. I've got this sort of like teaching gig that I think, I remember the language he used. He goes, I think you'd have the right temperament for this. <laughs> and he said, I, I just need someone to come in and teach guitar and bass to a handful of actors for this TV show that's like going to be based around music of the 60s and 70s. It's, you know, um, his accomplice in in many things is, is this incredible guitar player and producer, Blake Mills. At the time they were running Sound City, which is a, a legendary recording studio yeah. in Los Angeles. And so we said, hey, you know, we need someone to come to Sound City pretty much every day and like teach these actors how to play the songs that Blake is writing and recording for this TV show. Which does sound right up your alley in oh, many yeah. ways, right? I mean, yeah. it's great. I'd, I'd, done, I'd done private lessons, you know, since I was a kid here and there. Yeah. I like teaching. Yeah. I really like teaching when the student is motivated to learn. <laughs> I think that's how all teachers yeah, are, right? right, right. Um, and, uh, and this just seemed like a really neat, unique experience. So I was like, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm not going to turn this down. And uh, so that was the call to get involved and start working as a guitar, what they call like a guitar coach and a bass coach for actors on the show Daisy Jones and the Six. And it's an Amazon limited series. Uh, Amazon wanted these actors who came from, some of them came from musical backgrounds, some not. Um, None of them had really 
focused on music in quite some time um, if they were musical individuals and they needed to learn how to play their instruments. They needed to learn how to play these songs, which were not simple. Like Blake doesn't, isn't known for the simplest chord structures, song structures, time feels. It's very intricate, very, um, very specific, you know, um, is the best way I can put it. I mean, so tasty yeah. and, and so much fun to learn these songs, but then to sort of translate all of that into lessons that were digestible for people who were really picking up this instrument for the first time or yeah. first time in a while. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a real ask and Amazon wanted them to be a functional band. Yeah. Not Bezos. just Bezos himself. Was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It was just, you know, the word came from on high. Like yeah. we we don't just want this to be, you know, they understood music is the engine of this show. Yeah. It's the engine of this story. It was a um first a book by Taylor Jenkins oh. Reid. Okay. Um the, I guess Reese Witherspoon, who has, you know, Reese's book club. She had received an advanced copy of this book, devoured it, and called Scott and Lauren Newstetter, who ended up being very big central parts of the television show, um, show running and writing and uh, producing. And <laughs> so, you know, sort of called them and said like, hey, we want to, we should option this as a script, you know, meaning like, I, I want to get first dibs on this book to turn it into something whether it's a movie or a television show or something like that. She saw, Reese saw that this had legs for the screen. Um, and uh, so that whole process started way before I ever got involved. I mean, by the time I got involved in January of 2020, it was already in various pre-production and writing stages for like four years, three years maybe. Um, and the original thing was, you know, the original ask was come in and teach them as best you can. You've got like two or three months and then they're going to start shooting the show. Well, that was January, 2020. We got two months in. We didn't get into being in front of cameras or anything like that yet. So we were still technically in that pre-production phase, meaning there was no production to really shut down when COVID hit. What happened was, um, we just started doing lessons remotely on Zoom. And just like the rest of the world, we have, you know, on Zoom, hours and hours a day, you know, teaching these actors who remained dedicated, you know, every single one of them, you watch the show, they, they, they all, they all had to look at me on their computer <laughs> for hours a day and they really showed up for it. Uh, and, and ultimately it was through that experience of sort of working with, you know, like, I was working with the bass player in the cast, the two leads in the band, you know, um, the Daisy and Billy characters, um, and then working with the lead guitar player. So that's like most of the people in the band already. Because of that, I just had this working relationship for a couple months by the time COVID hit. And they needed somebody who was gonna kind of work with them as a band, kind yeah. of. Someone to help them go from learning the songs and sort of being isolated in their own individual one-on-one -on -one lessons to stepping onto a stage, amplifying their instruments, singing into microphones, and Making communicating with each other yeah. in the way that bands do. Yeah. Um, and they, I guess, I feel really lucky, really grateful, and, and flattered. They all felt comfortable enough working with me that right. they wanted me to be that person too. So that led to becoming the musical director of the show. Um, and that work really was just a continuation of the work I was doing as their guitar coach and their bass coach um, and just helped them start to feel more like a band. And just as with producing, it was so much about, you know, creating an environment where they felt comfortable to explore and experiment and take chances. And, you know, playing music is a really vulnerable thing, yeah. especially for people who don't, Typically it. play yeah, music. Exactly. It's like terrifying. Yeah. yeah, to even make a sound and yeah, yeah it's like yeah. have it be really loud. And yeah. it just took practice and it took, yeah, as much comfort as possible in the room. And ultimately I was really proud, you know, to to have them come to me 
you know, about a year or so into the process after we had gotten back in person after the sort of initial COVID lockdown and we, yeah. we were all able to like test every day and mask up and be in the same room again. And they, they, they started to want to conduct their own rehearsals. They were like, they, they literally came to me and they were like, hey, do you think that we could maybe like drive this thing a, a couple of times ourselves? It's like, absolutely. That's the best news. You know, like yeah. you want, you want this to take on its own shape. I don't want to be, you know, a necessary component for the rest of the time that you yeah. guys are doing this. Like the ideal is that you feel like a band and you feel like a band to the degree that you are a band. Yeah. yeah. And most bands don't have this other person like standing in front of them, driving their <laughs> rehearsal all right, the time. Right. Uh, so they, they really, they really did that, you know, and, and, uh, and learn how to play and sing. And um, yeah, I just, I'm like, you know, watching the show, I'm like a proud papa or something, yeah, you know, it's just yeah. incredible to see, to know where everybody started on their instruments. Um, you know, Riley Keough hadn't really ever played guitar. Sam Claflin hadn't ever really played guitar. These are the two lead characters of the story and the two main lead singers in the band. They get the most screen time. They have to be in these intimate sort of songwriting scenes together where you're really just on them. Yeah, yeah. And it's and key believable, that they know how to yeah, play. They have yeah. to know. They have yeah. to know what they're doing and how to, you know, and even if it's not them playing the guitar right. in a particular scene, yeah. they're, they're, they still need to move in a way that makes sense for the scene and, and behave with their instruments. Especially if in musicians way. are going to watch it. <laughs> Which, of course, I mean, you, know, you get Blake on the music and you yeah. get, you know, like Phoebe Bridgers and Jackson Brown and Taylor Goldsmith co writing songs for the show. Like, and Marcus Mumford co-writing songs for the show. It's like, yeah, musicians are going to pay attention. So I think they knew that to a degree. Amazon knew that. And it's why it was such a priority for, you know, for that cast to become the band that they became. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that seems like it was uh, a good project for you to jump into when things kind of shut down too. And so you yeah. went... I guess, I don't know, how many years did you work on that, that show? Well, yeah, it went from being like a two-month job to a two-and-a-half-year job. Okay, well, um, and it probably interweaved with touring with Amos at that point, too. Yeah, it, it basically worked out so that, um, well, COVID, you know, like someone on our set, whether it's an actor or, or a crew member or whatever, would get COVID, so we'd have to shut things down, or we had to re negotiate the schedule and yeah. that's a massive undertaking right. for a show that it really 90% of it was shot on locations as opposed to on the studio lot. So it wasn't really controlled environments. Um, spaces had to be like reserved ahead of time and streets had to be shut down. And you know, it's yeah. like crazy amount of things have to happen for like a day of shooting. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, yeah, all through sort of 21 and 20 up until April of 22, I was working on set on the show and I jumped out of that, which ultimately meant that I wasn't working on set for the last couple episodes worth of stuff. Um, I had been going back and forth between Los Angeles and, uh, uh, and New Orleans where we were, with the whole company kind of moved, the whole company kind of moved and set up shop in New yeah, Orleans right. um, for the big concert scenes like towards the end of the series there's like you know the band gets bigger they play bigger stadiums and things like that so um that's where we shot those things and i ultimately went from new orleans after a couple of weeks of shooting straight to portland maine for a week of rehearsal with amos and then that's what started our like month on month off touring schedule in right. 2022 wow uh and that led straight into you know becoming a father yeah. and ultimately you know, getting out of LA and moving yeah. back, moving back here. Yeah. And so what are you up to? What are you up to now? <sighs> Taking some deep breaths and, Good. and raising a baby. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, Cynthia and I are both just still learning about what our careers look like now yeah. and what that balance is. Um, I expect you will always be doing that. Yes. Right? You know? Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> it's strange and it's new and it's uncomfortable at times, but, 
uh, I'm still making a lot of music. I'm, I'm writing a lot of my own music. I'm working a lot out of uh, Ghost Hit Recording Studios in West Springfield. Nice. We talked about Andrew earlier on, yeah. Andrew O'Dell, another person I grew up with who just is a powerhouse engineer and artist in his own right. And his studio, Ghost Hit, is like my favorite place to, yeah, to make music. So I've been making music there. Um, I've been making music here uh, at, at my house where yeah. we are now yeah. um, in our home studio. And um, just getting back into, it's a changed landscape here, right, yeah. Jake? I mean, it's like, it's, it's a new music scene it than is. it was yeah. before COVID. Yeah, and especially, yeah, the Northampton as being a stronghold is not really there as much as it was. It seems like it's kind of it might be coming out, back, it might right? Be coming back, yeah. But it's different, and like, yeah, to come back and be like, you know, I'd have like Colin Jalbert would be like, "Do you want to go see Butcher Brown at uh, the Drake?" And I'd be like, "What is the Drake? <laughs> yeah, what? Right, right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or you know, uh, oh, there's a club in Amherst. Oh, that's not the High Horse anymore. You yeah. know, things would just change, and uh, all these places that I'm so used to yeah. feeling like." Are like the hot spots at home the establishments are, yeah. have moved or yeah. has shifted, and and um, it's been a real joy to just reacclimate. And you know, right here in Holyoke, we've got the Divine Theater, which is such a cool place. Yeah. Uh, the Marigold in East Hampton, like I said, the Drake in Amherst, um, of course, the Parlor, Parlor Room, Room yeah. such a special place in Northampton. Yeah. And they're they're all there are always new venues and always new artists to become acquainted with in this area. Yeah. So yeah. it's an exciting time to, to be, yeah, to it be is. part of that. All right, Ryan, thanks for uh, having me in your space here and for chatting, chatting it up. Thank you for coming over just so I can talk in your face about myself for a couple uh, hours. Happy to, happy to. Uh, it was really fun, Jake. I, I can't wait to hear uh, all the rest of the episodes of the podcast and I'm um, here to do it anytime. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. See you. I got the triple. I got a, I ain't got no triple. I got AAR. <laughs>